Shalom, brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath. Shalom. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. So here we are at Pencroft Lane in Claycross uh, to, to hold our sacrament meeting. And we pray that you've got your ambulance ready and your, your wine or water. And uh, I'd like Kyle to invite the Spirit for us today. Dear Heavenly Father, King of the Universe, we ask that thy presence will be with us this morning as we partake of thy sacrament. We ask thee, in the name of thy Son, a great blessing and gift to us. We say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Yes, we had our prayer meeting on Wednesday night and we prayed for all the people that were in the book. And we just think of Joyce and Andy, Joyce's sister yeah. passed away the yeah. other day. And we just pray that you will comfort her. So as we go into reading the sacrament. At this time, we welcome all present to Christ's table. We invite all who would participate to do so as an expression of the peace and love of Jesus Christ, in whose name we worship. The Lord's Supper is a sacrament, a time to focus on the life, death, and resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As disciples of Christ, we renew our covenants and recommit together to His mission, to grow closer to Jesus Christ as individuals and as a community, worshipping Jesus Christ through God's Word, the sacraments, ministry, outreach, Kabbalah, and Jubilee. We encourage all that are worthy to receive communion to do so frequently and devoutly. Uh, if you like to bow or kneel, and uh, we should get ready to say, the prayer. Do you want to say the bread? So Kyle will bless the bread. Um, I forgot my glasses, brothers and sisters. <laughs> <laughs> like Mr. McGoo. <laughs> so I will bless. So if you'd like to rest, uh, kneel or bow, whatever's right for you. O oh God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of thy body, of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him and keep his commandments, which he have given them, that they may always have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. So as we come to the wine, I ask thee to bow, kneel, or whatever's good for you. I just commence saying the prayer. And we pray like this, O God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do it in remembrance of the blood of thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember him, that they may have his spirit to be with them. Amen. Amen. So as we pause, we remember what Jesus did for us. Shalom, brothers and sisters. For this week's Sabbath message, I was asked a really good question 
And that is what happens after we die. What do Mormons believe happens after we die? I'm going to talk today about why I don't generally talk about that a lot. Because there is no one common answer to this question. Even when I was a Brighamite and belonging to one particular church, there were different ideas of what happened. There's, there's a little picture that people showed, but what that picture meant and the understanding of, of the, the terms in it, it varied quite a bit depending on who you talk to. So today what I want to talk about is why I feel that even though it's in, eternally important, it's not a focus for me, at least not in my ministry. In the Book of Mormon, and I'll place some scriptures down in the description below, but in, in the Book of Mormon, it talks about this idea that now is the time. This is, this is when you get right with God. So even though, you know, growing up a Brighamite, I was taught that, you know, I, I went to the temple once a year starting when I was, I think it was when I was 12, uh, when we did, we did baptisms for the dead. And so there's this idea that people can choose to follow Christ in the next life, which fits in with uh, some things that Paul said in, the, in Romans and in Corinthians. But it's still up to them as well. I think they choose to accept. And what I was taught back then, it was also dependent on whether they had an opportunity to accept Jesus in this lifetime or not. And so even with that, there was a lot of confusion or uh, what I like to call theoretical theology as to why we were doing it. Uh, some people said that if you were a born-again Christian, well, that's great, but because you didn't have the right kind of baptism, you were waiting to get into heaven. You're a good Christian, just waiting for some, for some Mormon to baptize you. I mean, I, maybe. Um, I have a couple of thoughts on that. I'm not going to get into it today. Uh, and then the other one is, was this idea that if someone had taught you the gospel, you know, a missionary knocked on your door, whatever, and you rejected it, then we still did the baptism for you, but it was too late because you had your chance. But the reality is that we just don't know. We, we don't have enough information. And I think that if we focus on this life, then we're able to accomplish quite a bit more. I think if we just think to ourselves, hey, I don't need to worry about what, where I go after I die until after I'm dead then we're not going to build the kind of personal relationship with the Lord that we need. So why then do I not talk about this more? And there's a, a brother, he's a leader of one of the branches of the Latter-day Saint movement that um, I am aware of. And he is aware of me, but we don't really know each other. So I'll say it like that. We've interacted on Facebook. He posts a lot of stuff about how Everybody's going to hell. Nobody really knows who God is except for, you know, the people in his church and just, you know, those type of things. And, you know, I say that and you can literally guess that it's anybody because what he's doing is not uncommon in the Christian movement, right? Maybe he's just an evangelical Christian. He doesn't even have to be a Latter-day Saint, but he is. I grew up in an area that was very conservative and very Protestant. So... I really got to know Protestantism very, very well. In our public schools, teachers would preach against Mormonism and you know, talk about this idea that everyone's going to hell. Uh, my grandmother was a Protestant. She would talk to me about this idea of being afraid of hell. And so I started investigating all these other churches. And of course, the easiest ones to check out were the conservative Protestant churches right there in my area. And the thing that they did especially when they saw me, was the same thing that I heard in high school. You're going to hell. Salvation comes from Jesus, and you can only find it in the Bible. You know, Joseph Smith was a fraud, and all these type of things. And I, I wasn't feeling it. I, I don't feel God in anger. I don't feel God in wrath. I, I feel God in when, when I feel the love of God and the peace of God. And I remember I was talking to someone after church one time. There's a woman... She had come to church, and, and it, was, it was amazing. She, the, the guy did the whole fire and brimstone. He got up in her face, and he'd done it to me before, and, and I'd come back. But he was just right up there in her face telling her she was going to go to hell. At the end, they did what's called an altar call. And she, was, she, she came to the front. She said, anyone that wants to be born again, come to the front. She was crying, huge tears. I was like, wow, 
Protestantism is this this is like being a rock concert. This is pretty cool. Um, and I turned to the person I was with afterwards and I was and I was like, this is amazing. And I, like I, like like I guess we'll see her again next week. And she was like, uh, no, we won't. What I was told was that she comes every year for Easter, Palm Sunday, uh, Christmas, and I think one other, but basically like four times a year. And it and it every time and if she comes if she if she does the altar call for Palm Sunday, she doesn't come for Easter. But basically she does the whole thing where she cries, she's born again, and then afterwards she doesn't come back. I'm like, why didn't she come back? And and the the lady I was with told me it's because we go out, we've had people go out and visit her and ask her why she hasn't come back. And the reason why is because in the moment she comes to Christ out of fear. But once the fear is gone, she doesn't see any reason to come back. She's not afraid anymore. So I was like, so she isn't truly converted? And she's like, I don't know how it works. Because obviously she's converted. You see her doing this. You see the Holy Spirit in action. And I'm like, no, now that you told me this, I'm not seeing the Holy Spirit in action. What I'm seeing is fear in action. And brothers and sisters, I want you to develop a personal relationship with God out of faith. If you're afraid of God, are you going to pray in an open and honest way, wanting to communicate with someone you're, you're afraid of? Some of the uh, kids that I knew in school, and, and I mean, this is an unfortunate reality, had abusive parents. And the abuse ranged from verbal to physical to anything you can imagine. Now, when those kids had a problem, who do you think they went to with that problem? it probably wasn't the abusive parent, right? They would talk to their friends. If they were lucky, they had a teacher they could talk to. If they were lucky and there was someone at their church they could talk to, they would talk to them. But they couldn't go to that abusive parent. So when you see people preaching fire and brimstone and everybody's going to go to hell, it may break hearts, but it doesn't pierce them. It doesn't convert them. They're not feeling that love of God that you need to build that personal relationship. So the reason why I don't talk about the afterlife a whole lot is because this is the life. Now is the time when we come to Christ, when we build that personal relationship with the Lord. Now is the time to feel God's love. And I don't believe that we're here to get to heaven. I believe we're here to bring the heavens to the earth. So if you want to know what the afterlife is going to be like from my perspective, it's going to be like whatever it is right now. However you perceive things now. If you see the love of God in the creation, then you will feel and be in the love of the creator in the next life. So I, I don't want to warn you about hell. I want to invite you to get to know God in a very real way. So if you walk away with anything today, Walk away with this. Know that God is real. God wants a personal relationship with you. You don't have to worry about hell if you have Jesus. And Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He came to save us. So let's focus on God's love and not God's wrath. And let's not worry about what's next. Let's worry about what's right here. Let's worry about and focus on the creation that's my Sabbath message, and I leave it with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So, brothers and sisters, that is the end of our, uh, our sacrament meeting for today. And we just bless and hope that you you have a God-blessed week this week. And, uh, and that hopefully peace will come on to, upon the earth. Uh, that we can all live in please peace. Uh, don't forget you will see the um website address and uh, don't forget on Thursday night seven thirty UK time and I think two o'clock in the US is is our prayer meeting time. So I'm gonna say a closing prayer. Loving Creator God, we thank you for this day. We thank you that we can come to you and have rest on Sabbath. We thank you for all the gifts you've given us. We thank you for your guidance through the Holy Spirit. 
And I say these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.